John, let's welcome Jonathan Smith, the head coach of the Oregon State Beavers, the number one scoring offense in the Pac-12, seventh in the nation in rushing. They got the number one runner in the pack. They got the number one tackler in the pack. They um, play Colorado this week, and win number six would be the best uh, nine-game start for the Beavs since 2013. Their coach is in his fourth year, and he's a Beave, and he's a walk-on, which they didn't have the Burlesworth trophy back when you played, Coach, or you would have had a shot at that thing that Baker Mayfield's won a couple times. And you got a guy up for it this year, too, so welcome. Yeah, thanks, guys. I need to talk about that. Jaden Grant, I think, is up for that, and uh, he's worked real hard. And Yeah, it's uh, he's a good one, and we feel like we got some good things going. we got a, another big game this week. You know, what's when we see – I mean, you're a younger guy – young offensive coaches i would say in 2021 we think passing the ball uh but in the nfl i mean in our backyard kyle shanahan and all his minions throughout the league are, are run first guys it seems like you you know do, are, do you consider yourself a run first offensive coach or is it just the personnel that you have at the school right now i'd, I'd like to think it was run first you know in some of the background that i've done offensively we do want to find ways to run the ball didn't always do it exactly the same way um, I will tell you, Brian Lingering heading up our offense, and he, he's been about uh, running the ball and complementing that run game with some play action pass and formationally. And so we feel like we have established an identity. Each year we've been here kind of building toward an offense that can score a lot by running the ball, and, and Brian's doing an awesome job with it. And each year gotten better on defense. I think that's the thing that has really stood out, right? When you got there in 2018, Oregon State was 129th in defense, 46 yeah. points a game. You guys are 26 and a half points per game now, 20 points better. It's gotten better every year. Are there ever times when you're building a program the way you've been doing it that you you wonder like, is this working because the because the road is long? Yeah, it it's not easy. Like you mentioned in that at, at where we started at for year one, um, having really the confidence enough to know that you feel like your approach is correct, the scheme you're implementing it will, will work when you're not seeing the immediate success. And uh, that's why I appreciate our, our staff. You know, we've had some great continuity on our staff, tried to establish things year one that we would build off of, and, it, and it's played out that way. I think schematically, offense, defense, special teams, we're doing similar stuff year uh, four that we were doing year one. You know, I, I didn't know much about your personnel coming into the season. I remember, uh, I think you guys, late at night, you played USC several weeks ago, and, and your running back, B.J. Baylor, I just went, holy moly, this kid's a player. And I texted a guy on your staff, and he, he told me the recruiting story. I, I, maybe you beat out Liberty or whatever school. Part of the cool part about, you know, being the head coach of a program like yours is you're not always getting the five-star guys. I mean, you were getting some diamonds in the rough, but then you produce them into guys that potentially have an NFL future. How good is this guy, and what was his story from a recruiting standpoint? Yeah, BJ um, is a good player. BJ's been here. He was here before I even arrived. And so you asked the recruiting story on him. I don't totally know. I just know he was in our program. I give him a bunch of credit because in this day and age, it's not easy to kind of have to wait your turn. And he kind of needed to do that. We had another back last year. Jamar Jefferson had some big-time numbers, had a couple of big-time years, and he's playing for the Lions now. And, you know, BJ's turn was this year, and he's he's taken advantage of it. Um, kept working throughout, and, and now his skill set uh, physically, but he knows the scheme, um, and, he's, and it's, he's having a great year. He wasn't on the recruiting board at, when you were at Washington? I don't remember him on that board, <laughs> uh, I'll be honest. <laughs> How did you get when you were at Washington? Do you how do you recruit? Um, do you recruit regionally? Do you recruit positionally? What do most people do? How do you guys do it? You know, what we're we're we want to be in the Pac-12 footprint, heavy amount. We're never going to say no if we have some type of connection across the country outside of that. But majority of our stuff's going to be in the footprint of the Pac-12. We've had some success in Texas, and again, some of that had come from a connection to a coach, and then we've we've gotten into similar schools after signing a guy or two. Um, we do uh, have areas for our coaches, but then the you know the position coach becomes the really the lead recruiter on that, and then I try to complement that um, as the process goes along. You were just at a De La Salle game, right, the night before the Cal game. I was, yeah. I was. How do you how do you balance that as the head coach? You know, when you're traveling, you know, especially in the Pac-12, like you said, the footprint. Do you always try to hit a game with a kid that you're interested in, or it depends. Yeah, I try to do that. Uh, 
at the same time being at a limited distraction to our current team, obviously we're getting ready to play a game the next night. Uh, I, I do feel like our team, our roster currently knows that recruiting's 24 seven. You gotta be doing it all the time. And so they're aware, didn't change our schedule at all for me to be able to see uh, some game and then get back for an evening meeting. And so anytime I get a chance to see somebody in person play, I, I love it to not just see the recruit, but I love high school football and the atmosphere is that that are at games. And so I, I try to do it a bunch. Do you pick any, uh, do you pick up any tricks and plays and that kind of thing when you're watching? Oh, heck yeah. 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 Not just when you're in person, but you watch all this high school film, you know, there's some good ideas on, and there's some good coaches at, at the high school level. And so anytime we can steal something, we're going to do it. Uh, like people, where, where did, where, sorry, John, John, I was gonna say, where did this play come from two years ago up at the screen? You've got a guy in a black uniform lying down in a black end zone secretly. Yeah. Oh yeah. I don't think you can uh, do this anymore. You guys. Yeah. They changed the rule on that. And that's, again, that wasn't definitely not my uh, <laughs> original thought. We ran the same thing at UW um, when I was at Washington. Actually, we were playing Oregon state here in the stadium. We ran the same thing with a, a one of the returners laying down and threw it back to him. You know, you're talking to two Fresno State guys that had a front row seat on a guy named Chris Peterson running trick plays until oh, yeah. the cows come home. I mean, to me, that's got a Boise influence written all over it right there. <laughs> yeah. That's what it's probably was, Coach Pete. He, yeah, he was. He's creative offensively, uh, never shy to try try something fun. And, and I think the players like that. When you practice something, it's a little bit different, and, and you actually get it called and executed. It's, it's, ad. it's, a, it's fun. How did you get connected with Chris Peterson to Boise? You were uh, you were at what, Idaho, Montana, so, and then Boise. Yep, I was at Montana at the time. I had known Coach Pete not well, just kind of met him because he was actually the receiver coach at Oregon when I was the quarterback here at Oregon State. Um, and we had a, a mutual uh, kind of friend. Um, but it was a little bit out of, the, out of the ordinary. I got a call when I was at the University of Mont Montana. They were looking for a quarterback coach and uh, went down there and and interviewed and and was obviously fortunate enough to, to land the job um, and then he's made a huge impact on my coaching career and philosophy uh spending six years with the guy you know i i don't think you're alone but is it safe to say that going to boise state changed your career oh yeah without question and and you know boise was a great place and program but ultimately it was really chris peterson that staff uh changed it i uh, learned a bunch um, got exposed to, I think, some elite coaching and culture building and vision uh, by him, and he's that's really put an imprint on on me as a coach now. I remember Bruce Feldman wrote a story about him, and it's this is a question about offensive coordinators becoming head coaches a few years ago. And one of the things I think he said was that he was a little hesitant to take over the head coaching job at Boise because all he ever wanted to do was just draw plays on napkins and call plays and be left alone. So then you know you you become a play caller, then you get a head coaching job, and what like what do you try to hang on to play calling? Like what do you do, and how do you let it go, and how does that change your enjoyment of the game? Oh, yeah, it changes it quite a bit um, because I don't I don't call plays here. Brian and that's offensive staff contributes a ton to the plan. And Brian calls the plays and, and I'm due. There's times I miss it because uh, I really enjoyed that part and being able to just kind of focus in on game planning and, and thinking through when you can want to call plays in that. Uh, I just felt like when I did become the head coach um, to give it my best effort to do the best job I could as a head coach, I couldn't hold on to that to that part. And so you got to try to surround yourself with some really good people. We've been able to do it, and those guys on offense have been doing a great job. And and so I, I stand on the sideline and watch it. How do but you, you make the court? Yeah. Do I miss it? But you miss it a little bit. Oh, 100%. And Brian knows that, but yeah, 100%. <laughs> How do you, you know, when you have a, uh, you know, the offensive or defensive coordinator, the head coach is that side of the ball. Is it incumbent on you to make that guy feel secure, like you're not kind of overlording him, but also you are the boss? How, how do you? I'm fascinated. How do you balance that? Well, for a couple of Fresno guys, so I think Jeff Tedford had uh, as good an insight on that, and because I asked him about that kind of thing, and he just said, you know, either you're going to be in it or you're out. Don't occasionally pop in when you walk into the room; it changes the dynamic. And so I try to create some space for him. Uh, I try to give them some ideas once in a while, but really emphasize that they can choose when they want to use them just because the head coach is saying it doesn't have to be in the plan. Um, and it's been great. Me and Brian have known each other for a long time. Sometimes he wants some feedback and I'll give it to him. 
Uh, but I don't try to be one foot in, one foot out, really letting them, those guys uh, come up with plans. Was that with Pete with you also at Washington? How, how was that relationship a little different? <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, he was great. He really was. Uh, because I, I asked him. I wanted him to be around because, let's face it, the he's guy's pretty good. You know, <laughs> He's good at it. Yeah, he's creative. And so, uh, no, he was, he was great to work for. He'd throw ideas at you. Um, he'd see trends in whatever we were doing or a particular player and saying, hey, I'm not seeing it the same way you're seeing it. And so – he was awesome to have input um, pretty consistently. You guys when had I an first... offense. Oh, go ahead, John. Yes, sir. no, fire away, guy. I was just going to ask, you guys You guys had an offense in Washington that was with Dante Pettis and John Ross and the college football playoff. And, like, did it feel like everything you called that year worked? That was a pretty good year. Uh, when you had that kind of talent um, at receiver, but our old line, we had draft picks at a line. Miles Gaskin was carrying the ball along with LeVon Coleman. Jake Browning, the quarterback, was you know just a winner, uh, decision maker, accurate. So yeah, those were some 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 fun times. It's almost like you got to appreciate that stuff when it's going on because you know you get in this coach's mentality. It's like oh, on to the next week, and oh, we could have done this better. We scored forty eight points, but we could have done this and that. You know, I wish I would have enjoyed that a little bit more on the week to week. At the end of it, yeah, looking back, it was fun. When I got hired with the Eagles, Sean McDermott was on the staff, and he actually reminds me a lot of you, like your Boise, Chris Peterson, very intellectual. He's the head coach at, with the Bills. And he was always so fascinated by what was going like, – he always asked, like, what was in the water? And that was that was like 2010, 11, right at the time in the peak, and you came right then, right after Kellen Moore. Clearly, you guys – you had that at Boise, and then you guys took it to Washington, and it feels like you're implementing a lot of – what what is that like? What what is it that? And I know you say it's Chris Peterson, but clearly a lot of your guys you see with Wilcox, Harson's having a lot of success now at Auburn. Like you guys just kind of understand something. I don't whether it's the people, the player. I don't know. I don't. It's more than just scheme. Clearly, yeah. I think that uh, you know people matter. Meaning the elite coaches. There's a bunch of them, but getting that combination of elite coach to elite uh, person. You know the day to day for your uh, culture how they treat uh, you know, this idea of a constant state of improvement. There's always another way to think about it, a better way to do it. Uh, had been ingrained from Coach Pete that I think a lot of those guys you mentioned uh, are doing a great job and are really, really sharp. Um, and so, you know, I think, too, this idea of simplification, you know, and, and Pete would talk a lot about that in regards to it's almost like the greatest sign of sophistication is simplification. And if you look at some of the best offenses out there, you turn on the tape and oftentimes it looks pretty simple. It doesn't look overly, uh, but there's a lot of detail that goes into, into that. And so if you can simplify things for your players, they're going to play a whole lot faster. And oftentimes if the players are playing fast, you, you got a chance. To that end, Mike Tomlin said something yesterday about how hard free agency can be. If you get a guy young, you can, kind of build them up in your own system and set a, a, a set expectations for them and that free agency becomes a bit of a crapshoot. Um, you know, so when you are building that culture, like now the portal arrives yeah. and there's all these opportunities and what do you do? Like, do you resist it even if you think there's a fix or how do you balance that? Yeah, it is. It's a fine balance because we do want to be able to, you know, pride ourselves as a program of developing players when they arrive and they leave, they're just way better. And so hopefully you shouldn't have multiple years with them. At the same time, there's some good players in the portal. There's some times each year that, yeah, you need, need some depth, need a better player, a difference maker at a particular position. And so we're trying to balance that. We've been in the portal um, and had some success with some of the guys. Uh, I think the, the big piece is you're always trying to find the right fit, whether we're talking about a freshman coming in or a kid with one year that's a senior in college the fit your place that you know are about about playing football and a good dude to be around and and wants to finish school with a degree when you're the head coach in college you're kind of you know bill belichick you're the gm and the head coach right i mean there's not a guy ocho cinco comes through that program it's because yeah. you signed off on it right <laughs> yeah i mean that's that's part of the role of you know overseeing of who you're adding to your roster and, and coaching and the football in the scheme and uh, which is a great thing. That's why I go back to it's a big job. There's a lot going on. Um, you got to surround yourself with some some big time coaches, and I think we've done that. What was Ocho? I mean, what was Chad like when he showed up? He was uh, 
competitive, uh, funny, obviously, uh, personality, but kind of harmless. Like, you know, he just had a good time. He loved to compete in practice. Always thought he was open every play. Tell me if he didn't get the ball, it was like I was wide open. Um, and he, uh, he's done really well for himself beyond just playing. I text guy this morning. I said, was Jonathan Smith the quarterback of one of the most famous games in Fresno State history when they when they upset him at Fresno State and oh, David Carr it. was on Sports Illustrated? Yep, vividly remember it. Got hit quite a bit. And, you know, we Sports Illustrated picks this number one. We're not – we lost so many players the year before, but whatever. Uh, yeah, and then you go in there into Fresno at their place at night. Walk down that <laughs> ramp. Walk yeah. down. People are screaming at you. Oh, it's a tough place to play, man. And they were good. I mean, yeah. they had some players at the time, quarterbacks, uh, really good. I mean, that was that was a tough night. They beat Colorado and Wisconsin. Those were their first three games. Colorado, preseason number one, Oregon State, Wisconsin. Yeah. Anywhere, right? What was Pat Hill saying? Any, yeah. Anybody, anywhere, anytime. Yeah. 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 You, you guys have a little bit, you know, you're a Power 5 program, but relative to the Pac-12, you know, you wouldn't, I guess, be considered USC or Oregon. You kind of bring that mindset from being with Pete at Boise. It feels like he brought that to Washington and, you, you know, carry it over to what you're doing now. Yeah, I think there's huge benefit to chip on your shoulder, um, no back down. Um, and I like that mentality to play with and, you know, whether it's the school and where the, their place in the conference type thing. I just think ultimately any of it is uh, you want to play with a chip on your shoulder that you know nothing's going to be given to you. You got to go earn it. We talk about we talk a lot, so we talk about quarterbacks a lot because that's what you talk about, and the state of quarterback play, whether it's in the NFL, draft prospects, high school guys. I've talked to a lot of different people about it. John has too, whether it's you know less multi-sport athletes or um, whatever. I, I don't know the guys playing earlier. You played early. We went back and looked in 2000, the year that that you guys went and you were the Fiesta Bowl MVP, the Pac-12 co-champs. There were 17 guys in college football that completed 60% of their passes. 17. This Ooh. year, there's 82 or 60% completion rate. And yet, it seems just as hard to find quarterbacks as it ever was. I don't know. What's your, what, I don't, what's your view on the state of quarterback play? Is it good? Is it bad? Is it the same as it's always been? Um, yeah, I, I know the schemes getting run offensively. 20 years ago comparison to now your completion percentage better be higher i mean like we did a lot of three-man route there's no check down I, I didn't throw a bubble screen i think my whole career you know of some of these quick hitting completion type plays so the scheme's quite a bit different um and look it i don't know if it's any worse uh maybe it's hard to separate the elite guys now because you can get muddled down and a lot of guys can, can complete a lot of passes and schemes that are getting run right now. Uh, so I, I, I don't have a great answer for you. Uh, I do think there's some good quarterbacks out there um, that are playing and, and even in our league, I think there's some quality play getting, getting done, but uh, yeah, I don't know. I just know. I wish I would have completed more than 50% of my passes. <laughs> Do you think it's easier to evaluate quarterbacks coming out of high school? Like when I was in high school, we ran the wing tee, you know, and, and now I, don't, I can't even imagine on the West Coast, and that was in Sacramento, even exists really. Most teams are, you know, I guess maybe De La Salle, but most schools are throwing the ball. So when you're evaluating a quarterback, I remember Andy Reid told me about Mahomes. He's like, he was actually a really easy player to evaluate. I just took out all the quick screens and evaluated all the throws, and he had a huge index of those throws. So you can just – you get instead of just evaluating 15 throws in high school, you get to evaluate maybe 35 if you remove some of the quick screens. Yeah, I, I do think there's more to evaluate nowadays because uh, one, they're throwing the ball more. Uh, a lot of times these guys are doing the, the seven on seven. They got the quarterback trainer, whoever they're developing or working with. Um, they're playing sometimes these set of seven on seven outside of their own team. And so they're just repping more and there's more to, more to see there on tape. Um, I'll still go back. I think these things like an educated guess because uh, it's not easy to to evaluate. There might just be more tape to to do it off. Of. How did you not get a camp invite? Like in 2021, you would have got a camp invite, right? I I didn't. Yeah, I called it good. I I, I knew I wanted to get into coaching. <laughs> I didn't go to like the pro day in the NFL for at, on campus here or anything. Um, did I you just go to your it. own pro day. No, I didn't. I, I was just ready to get into coaching. That's really why I came to Oregon State. I wanted to get into coaching and 
you know, sometimes I look back on that and go like, yeah, was that the best decision? Well, it is what it is. Um, so that's why I didn't, okay. I didn't have an agent. I didn't work out the pro day. I dove right into to coaching. You've lived, lived a pretty good football life in terms of being a, from the West Coast. You know, your last three jobs, Montana, which is one of the absolute gems in America from a football totally. standpoint. Totally. Boise, a football factory. And then you dub with Pete and now a head coach. You're, what, 41 years old? Like, that's, I, I've seen, a, we've all looked at a lot of bios, the guys moving around a lot farther than that. Yeah. Yeah. I do. I do. I feel fortunate that way because, uh, you know, growing up in Southern California, but to come to school here, I've been in the Northwest more than half my life now. Um, and we've really enjoyed each stop, uh, been around some big time coaches and people and had a blast doing it. Um, feel like this place fits me pretty well in regards to opportunity to be in this conference. You can, you can win here. Uh, but there's quality of life for my family. I got three kids now. And so, uh, yeah, fortunate. Uh, I know we're going to have to continue to keep on winning a couple games to be able to main stay, stay here. Uh, but so far so good. Did you well, win a national title at Montana? No, we won, we lost in the semifinals. Uh, awesome place. Awesome. You know, Washington Grizzly stadium had a bunch of, great players, coaches, uh, won the big sky, and we ended up losing the semifinal to San Houston. Jonathan, we love talking to you. We appreciate it. Keep it rolling. Big Beast yeah. fans here on the show, so thank you. It's good to, good to have you. Good luck, yeah, man. Yeah, appreciate you guys, man. Well, next time I'm in Fresno, what's it called? The Dog House? Is that what yeah, you uh... try tip sandwich. Yep. Was there when, you know, before recruiting went dead for COVID, I was out there. God, I got to get back there. It was good. <laughs>